Uh, and we've got Ilya Grigoric, uh, who's a developer uh, relations uh, in uh, Chrome, and specifically has promoted a lot WebP and, in general, really? many, many different performance uh, topics. Um, so I'll let Cornell introduce the, the topic here. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm going to start with an obligatory HTTP archive statistic. Uh, since 2010, the amount of bytes on a typical website used for images has tripled. And it's probably continued to grow as uh, larger and larger screens become more affordable. However, the situation is not as terrible as it seems, because average connection speed is also growing all across the board. Uh, in the last three years, uh, broadband speed in the United States has doubled, and in China, it has more than tripled. So um, on one hand, if you do absolutely nothing with your images, they'll load faster by 20 30% every year. On the, on the other hand, we're use, using up uh, all the bandwidth that we possibly can. Now, uh, looking at the other way, where the, those bytes coming from, it's probably um, safe for web. Adobe nailed this interface 15 years ago. It's probably still the most popular tool. Uh, however, uh, this is a manual workflow. It requires authors to know specifics of image formats, which are the best, and tune all the settings. Uh, and as we get new image formats, uh, new optimizations, the workflow becomes uh, even more uh, tedious and complex. Fortunately, uh, new tools are coming. For example, um, Adobe Generator can automatically export all layers uh, of a Photoshop file and optimize it uh, using latest tools. There are also uh, tools like ModPageSpeed or uh, Akamai uh, front-end optimization proxy that will automatically compress images optimized for each browser specifically. We have more new stuff. Uh, the picture element. Now, in the latest browsers, we can adapt images to uh, screen depth, screen size, aspect ratio, and we can also use uh, new formats uh, with a graceful fallback. HD2 is going to make uh, delivery of images really, really interesting. With HTTP1, browsers have to delay uh, image requests to let uh, CSS and JavaScript load first. However, in HTTP2, the server has a control over this and can send the first 5 or 10% of an image file that contains image size and the first progressive uh, layer, then let CSS load then re send the rest of the data. This way, the browser, when it does the very first layout, very first paint of the page, can already put some rough version of the images in. Next, new formats like the PNG. Uh, it's been 17 years, and GIF is still doing great. <laughs> like, how, why are we so bad at getting rid of all the formats? Uh, it, PNG with uh, GIF-like transparency worked uh, since IE4. That would be like 147 Chrome versions ago. <laughs> <laughs> and you might be thinking, oh, those are probably anim GIFs. But no, with, with an average size of just 7 kilobytes, the, all those GIFs, like the quarter of images on the web, could be replaced with a uh, better format already today or 17 years ago. Now, the real, real new formats. Uh, it's an interesting situation. Uh, we've got WebP, which is a very clever hack. It's like one frame of a video uh, adapted into uh, an image format. So it's very good at uh, saving low quality images. Uh, Google is promoting the format very heavily and is dogfooding this. Um, however, other vendors are still unconvinced. Microsoft developed a JPEG extended range format, which is aiming to be a very high quality format for digital cameras. Uh, that could potentially re re replace <coughs> the raw format uh, in digital cameras. However, for the use cases on the web, the compression uh, is not that impressive. And Apple has been supporting JPEG 2000 for a while. The format itself is as old as it seems, and yet uh, failed to uh, get significant traction. Uh, arguments against JPEG 2000 are the same as arguments against uh, the other formats, that is, uh, anything younger than 20 years 
could be subject to submarine patents, and the large corporations that are already harassed by patent trolls uh, don't want to take extra risk. Uh, newer formats are more computationally complex, uh, so it could be slower to decode. And finally, uh, it's a matter of opinion whether uh, the gain of 20 or 30 percent of the file size uh, is worth the pain of adopting the new format uh, in all the browsers, image editing tools, uh, image viewers, uh, native apps, and everything else. Mozilla has uh, studied some of the new formats, and they've concluded it's not worth it. They uh, decided to stick with JPEG and uh, improve the compression of JPEG instead. So most JPEG encoder um, has been released. It narrows the compression gap a little bit with uh, newer formats. Uh, however, because of the uh, backwards compatibility, uh, it cannot add alpha channel. It works with all browsers, but it's limited to what JPEG can do already. So for alpha channel, we have to resort to hacks like uh, lossy PNG encoders or masking with SVG, uh, unless we uh, have a newer format. And there are even newer formats that's like next generation ahead that maybe will be in the future or not. So uh, H.264 is the most popular video codec. Uh, on the web today, and its successor could potentially be used as a static image format. Uh, in tests, it looks really, uh, really good. However, it's non-free codec, it's patented, so it's a big problem for open source software. A VP family of codecs uh, is being developed and extended, uh, and it's looking uh, uh, really well. And there's an uh, experimental new codec from uh, XIP uh, and Mozilla called DALA, um, but it's still too early to say whether uh, this will be successful or not. And a surprise, JPEG extensions are being worked on. Uh, this is a way of adding new features to the old JPEG in a way that's hidden from old decoders. So the old browser will see boring old JPEG, but new browsers that add up the extensions could support JPEG with alpha channel, JPEG with better uh, dynamic range, and all the new features. And this work is ongoing and could be finished within a year. So that's where we are currently. Cool. Thanks, Cornell. <laughs> so I guess keying off that, uh, the first question deals exactly with these uh, sort of new image formats and one that's sort of constantly on my mind, which is what's the, what's the end game with these new image formats? Does one of these formats prevail and we sort of all agree that it's better than the others? Do all browsers support all the formats? Or do we just sort of need to cope to deal with it and, and kind of learn to live with this fragmentation? Um, I guess maybe, Ilya, I'll, I'll kind of start with you. I bug you about this question every now and then. <laughs> Why doesn't, like, should Chrome support JPEG XR uh, and, and IE support WebP and have everybody do everything? Ideally, everybody would implement every other's format. Uh, there's a lot of gotchas with doing that for their, their psychical reasons, there's political reasons, uh, anything to do with patents. There's, it's a very complicated subject. I think we need to get away from trying to design one image format that will rule them all, and instead accept that there is experimentation. There will be different formats, in fact, like, why, why is it so hard to deploy a new format? Why did it take us 10 years to deploy a PNG on the web? Right? That, that was a very painful process. So what do we need to fix in the ecosystem, in the platform, in the browsers, and everywhere else to enable this sort of thing? So there's gotchas uh, with deploying new formats, like more fragmentation. The developers have to deal with all these kind of more settings. I think a lot of that can be automated. So. I don't think we're going to see a feature where everybody's going to support everybody else's format. So you think basically you need to live with that fragmentation? Yeah, I think we need to remove some barriers. So today it's just very hard. Uh, I think we're going to get to some of the discussion around like saving uh, different formats and what happens when I can view something in the browser A, but I can't view it in the browser B, and my operating system can't preview it. Right? So we just need to work out those kinks. But I think once that's fixed, it just becomes much easier. And Cornell, do you think that, that, that when you look out into the future, one of these uh, you know, backward compatible image formats is kind of the, the way to go? Um, I don't know the future, but looking at the web's past, uh, you can see that the web is resisting uh, backwards incompatible changes. So we had XHTML, but that didn't work. Now we have HTML5 that built on backwards compatibility. We 
X forms didn't catch on. Uh, we had JPEG 2000 for a while, they didn't catch on. Um, and GIF is still alive. We have native video in the browser that's 15 times better than GIF and hardware accelerated, but anim GIFs are still everywhere because they work everywhere. Um, so uh, I think the existing formats, even though they're technically not the best, they have huge advantage because of the network effect. Uh, because JPEG works everywhere, we don't even realize how much the pain that is that uh, it has to be supported not only by uh, top four browsers, it has to be supported by your desktop operating system, by your mobile app, by your Twitter client, by a website where you upload your avatar. Uh, those decoders have to be everywhere. So what, but what's the solution for that? So I mean, we, we have that problem. I guess, Ilya, you kind of touched on this as well. I mean, do you think, is, is it picture element and, and kind of smarter? Um, I, I think that the picture um, mime switching use case is part of the solution. Another part of that would be uh, adding a key uh, header support so that they accept header, assuming that all browsers will publicize their properly, their newer formats and their accept headers. You could actually cache it better using the key header. And um, so, uh, yeah, hope for the best, hope that everyone will converge and plan for the worst, plan for fragmentation. So I think if, we, if we're kind of, or you know, moving towards this path that says, you know, we kind of need to live with it because, you know, Chrome would always try to auto-innovate uh, IE and vice versa, and also like, you know, generally where competition is good and it's moving us along. Mm -hmm. Is that, do you think, uh, and in that, is that realistic for somebody building a website? I mean, it's all good and well on the technology front, but. Um, yeah, I'd like to speak to like the um, the, the question, which is, um, you know, do will will we have like all these different image formats, or yeah. will one prevail? And um, I think, I mean, I agree that we should be like open to new formats and support them and new ideas. Um, but Cornell's right; like we have these image formats, and they're like cockroaches. They're you know, gifs, animated gifs aren't going away, right? Um, and uh, and I think that you know we've discovered in the last few years that we haven't actually appreciated what we've had uh, quite enough and that, and that JPEG is actually a, a really good image format. And there's a lot that we can do with JPEG, right? So um, I, feel like, uh, I feel like we should probably, um, you know, respect it a bit more. And that, it's a 20-year-old format, but what is it, Cornell? Like, I think somebody was calling it the um, alien from the future or alien something. Alien technology <laughs> from the future, yes. Yeah. Um, the, that uh, quote is in a context of how hard it is to beat JPEG, with, even though it's all format designed for computers that had 25 megahertz CPUs. Uh, now we have codecs designed for computers with gigahertz uh, CPUs, and we're not beating JPEG by a large margin, maybe 20, 30%, maybe 40% in very expensive experimental codecs. But we don't have a format that is 10 times better. Uh, so for its age, JPEG really nailed uh, uh, compression. Can yeah. we uh, get a mic to Jack so we can do a, we have? And I think that's really important um, to, you know, because we have JPEG and we can improve it. Um, so I think that, uh, what is it, Moz JPEG, is there, uh, Mozilla is actually working on, on um, improving the, the JPEG encoding. And I don't think anybody has done this for a long time. Like we've just had JPEG and we haven't thought about, about improving what we have and what already works. So um, that's something that we should focus on. You know, I, I, I do want to like, you know, have all these good ideas and, and have people like creating new image formats and try to support them and figure out ways we can support them. But, um, but at the same time, like, like we want to move forward and we haven't moved forward with image formats very much. So, um, so yeah, like kind of maybe I feel like we should think about what's important to us and agree on that and move forward. And I think that Sorry for taking so much time. Um, I think that one of the things that's important to me is, um, is progressive scans. Like a, I think that the image format that we invest in, that we spend our time talking about and, and implementing and serving, should be one that supports progressive scans. Okay. Uh, if you can stand up for the AV. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, I, speaking from a browser point of view, I, I agree with Ilya that we're never going to see like full support across all the browsers for all these different formats, but uh, I don't. I don't see why it, they really need to if we can somehow figure out a way for like a, a, I don't know, a new element or something like that to basically like you just say, here's the resource that I want regardless of some extension on the end of it and just 
have the like the browser send along its accepted abilities like of what it can have returned to it. Is that something that like is on the horizon, or is that something that anybody's like had interest in doing? It's yes. already here. Yeah. So th that exists. That that's content negotiation, and you send an accept header that says, "I support these formats," and the server then picks the right format, the optimal format perhaps, for that particular client. So that works today. But you can. For Uh, yes, yes. So that, that works today. Uh, Chrome will send an accept header that says, I support WebP. So in fact, that's how we recommend that you deploy WebP. And now you can also use Picture, where you can manually specify kind of all the different variants if you're willing to do that. So uh, just maybe to push back a little bit. So Cornell, you kind of pointed out, hey, it's just 20 or 30%. But you know, image bytes on the web have grown by two or three fold in, in just sort of two or three years. Um, and you know, for all indications, generally, where you know that trajectory is sort of up and to the right, yes. uh, saving twenty or thirty percent is not an insubstantial amount. Um, mm -hmm. Should should we should somebody make an effort if if we're doing all this different, uh, you know, if we're going towards a path of fragmentation, uh, is it worthwhile? It's a matter of trade-offs. Um, adopting new format will advance the industry by one year because this. The connection speeds grow by 30, 20, 30%. Yeah, so, well, arguably, page, uh, with a page new, sizes grow with, as well. With new format, we can do this year what we would be able to do anyway next year. So I think if we're looking for a completely new format, we should also look for something that current formats completely cannot do. Because what we have is the same thing we had 20 years ago, but better compressed. But how about new formats that support uh, different can, kinds of alpha channel that can uh, do additive blending, like all the blending modes in Photoshop mm -hmm. or um, yeah. hybrid pixel vector formats. Also, I think that, um, you know, like also stereo images, we never do 3D or think about 3D, but our eyes are actually seeing different pictures all the time. Why not support this in the future, right? Digital or stereo cameras may become a big, big hit in a year. Maybe. maybe. So, well, so, so a little bit of maybe a pushback on uh, the bandwidth is increasing and hence everything will be solved. That's not entirely true because bandwidth is only one part of it. We still have the RAM trips, and those RAM trips can only carry so much data. So even the fact that you have the latest LT connection on your phone doesn't mean you can just push a 10 megabyte image immediately. Yeah. Right. Well, so plus we have cellular, which is right. Not in fact, a 10 10 megabit uh, connection is but one megabyte a second. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So it'll take a second to download that image. And according to some of the best practices that we're pushing, we're saying like that your page should load in one second. So what about all the other resources? Yeah. So I don't think it's completely fair. Like it's certainly true that bandwidth, bandwidth is increasing. But that's not really yeah. enough of a justification to say these 20, 30 percent don't matter, and these two things will always go up yeah. at the same rate. If I, let's try to kind of move to the next question, which is actually kind of along these lines. So let's say we want to, you know, we want to live with these different multiple image formats. Um, what do you think, it, well, I guess I'll read the question. You know, given the need to serve a different image depending on uh, factors like display, so small screen to small image to small screen, browser capabilities for the image formats, network conditions, potentially lower quality image in a poor condition, should we be advocating for different URLs for all these different situations or for one dynamic URL that, uh, that sort of adjusts? And I guess if the latter, what's the right approach? Is it picture? Is it client negotiation? Um, and I, uh, ideally, I would say the best approach is the approach that works for uh, the developer that's maintaining the website. Uh, currently, there are problems with the single URL approach, mostly related to caching, mostly related to the lack of key support. But um, so this is something we will have to to work on in order to enable cacheable single URL images. But after that, it depends on its a development preference. Yeah, but still, what, what do we recommend? I mean, everything depends, and there's no golden answer. But should we try to advocate towards pushing people towards like one dynamic URL and to, f to push to put the effort behind that key header, or should we be advocating towards uh, the picture element? I think we should enable element? both because the use cases are different. A single URL means you have a, a smart backend CDN module, something that you control on the server side that pushes the right format to the right uh, browser. 
Uh, multiple URL give the control to the site's author, so you can do that. Uh, you can basically support multiple image formats and markup. It, these are different audiences. So you think we, we have to have the both? I think we have to have both. I think the, the yeah. practical answer is today, if you want to make it work and work well, you probably have to end up err on the side of in dedicated URLs just because your infrastructure in between, your CDN, your whatever is not configured, is not flexible enough to allow all of that. But I would like to fix that such that we move towards the world where you don't have to do that. Yeah. You don't have to have a unique URL for each. You, you don't have to have 100 URLs for the same damn image, right? Because yeah. one happens to be in a different format, one is scaled slightly different, one is cropped this way or that way. What, what, why is that? I mean, what do you think is the is well, the primary motivation, I guess, for having one URL versus, like today we're used to having one URLs and we don't need that just, complexity so cache. To me, works. it's just automation. I just want to yeah. move the, the world towards more, more automation. I shouldn't have to think about negotiating uh, the right image based on DPR. Yeah. We have to do that today. And I think that's just, in the long term, that's, that's just too much complexity. Also, yeah, you can also automate it with a build step, assuming, but yeah. But and I think we agree. Oh, just yes. that, you know, I think that, I think that we'd screw it up, right? Like, we wouldn't do it quite right if we did it ourselves. Um, and, uh, yeah. So you think we should have, no, we should strive towards that single URL, yeah. but we should also have automated tools mm -hmm. kind of generate or, or make some decisions or help us make the decisions around which image to send at any given time? Right. I mean, yes. we're, we're already doing a lot of the stuff by encoding, like, any sizable application already, already has an image resizing manipulation something server. Right? You have one source of origin or s source of truth, and then that one thing gets rescaled to all the different variants. And right now, we end up encoding a lot of information in the URL, even though a lot of that metadata is already available in the, like, in the image tag or the picture tag, because you're saying, like, my width is this, but then you duplicate the width in the URL as well. Um, we can just get rid of a lot of that, just make it much simpler. Okay. Well, if I can actually pull in something from a question we had further down, I mean, if we do that, when we talk about multiple image and, and one image, um, one use case that comes to mind is the notion of a single URL um, that can be um, fetched by any client and then maybe subsequently uh, by, you know, opened by your operating system and things like that. If we sort of focus for now on the, you know, sharing a link on, on Twitter and having anybody be able to client, do you think that's, does that, basically allevi uh, eliminate the possibility of making it be picture element based? So this, can I jump in? This is actually a good <laughs> argument against having a dedicated URL. So let, let's say you have uh, a dot JPEG and a dot WebP and a dot something else, mm -hmm. right? And the dot WebP is only configured to serve WebP. I see that because I accessed that thing in my browser that understands WebP. I copy that, I paste it into my email and then you open it in some other browser, and you, what then? You can't, yeah. you can't open it. Now it's a broken image. Yeah. So really, that URL, even though it says it's a .webp, needs to understand the fact that there are other clients that may not understand it, and hence serve a different asset. So we're back to the same, yes. so, same one so, URL. So given that, why do also, we need MIME-type decision in, in picture? I mean, you could also, uh, for example, have the browser expose, uh, save, share, shareable link, kind of, you know, expose the JPEG uh, URL when sharing stuff, expose the, yeah, so what you can save as, even though you view the WebP, if you're doing save as, save as a shareable format, so, so you're saving to that, you're saving to disk as JPEG. Right, so, so save as is a little bit of a different case though, right? So I agree, now we're into the discussion of Save, save a safe version, whatever that means. Yeah. Right? And perhaps this is something that browsers should do, like you're viewing this thing in whatever format, and when you're right-clicking and doing save as, should we give you like a PNG, right? Yeah. Maybe not good for size, but at least it preserves the quality and you can open it everywhere. Yeah. Should we do that? Maybe, maybe not. That doesn't really address the sharing of like, I copy the URL and yeah. paste if it into email. If you directly copy the URL, yes, I yeah. agree. This yeah. is a downside. Let's take a, a thought from the audience. Oh. Just on? Okay. So in regards to having a single URL and it not working if you copy to another 
uh, if you go to like a WebP in a Firefox or IE or whatever. Um, isn't that true of any proprietary format though that was pushed like MHTML formats didn't work in Chrome for like the first 10 versions of Chrome that they always worked in IE. Why is that just because something doesn't work, why is that necessarily a bad thing? And wh how is that like, so if I try and curl that image and there's no content negotiation automatically in curl without that, what would you serve or how, how does that sort of fit into this when you want a single URL? So you're right, it's, it's nothing new. I don't think that's a good experience overall, right? Because people tend to like to share photos and Exactly, yeah, that's all. That's I mean, people get pissed off, right? <laughs> They're just going to yeah. get angry at your site, at the site that um, provided this, this, um, this image that they couldn't share the way they're used to sharing. Yeah, it just has to work. Plus, having one URL for a negotiation of the format might actually be the easiest option for the developer if they install some kind of a server-side software like Mod PageSpeed that will just do it automatically. Um, so this is good for users because URLs just work. Uh, this is the best uh, in terms of bandwidth because every browser will get the best format it can. And it's convenient for uh, the developer because they just put one format on the server. It could be even a PNG. And then don't worry about a compression. Should we, uh, can we get a mic to, uh, to uh, uh, Westbrook and uh, Lucas? And in the meantime, it's just sort of worth noting to highlight a point that, uh, that uh, you have made before that we do need to uh, handle caches and that if we are going to have a single URL that's dynamic, it's right. important that we make sure, yeah. you know, whether it's your CDN yep. or your, your server-side caches or whatever, support that type of flexibility. Uh, yeah. can, just, can we just, sorry, let me just take a... Okay, just a w one second point. Uh, we have, you have had the same situation for video for a while. So I don't know if this is a big problem for video, but it's the same problem. I really like this concept of having the save as attached to a different file that you can sort of source after you're starting with a dynamic URL because we've been talking so far about the developer and the developer facing the end user. Um, but one thing that we haven't been talking about has been the content creator. And you know, if I'm talking about my friend's image that he took in Cabo, you know, maybe it doesn't really matter if all of the attributions and metadata that we're pulling out of that file to make our website's performance uh, is attached. But if this is like, you know, Nobel winning image, you know, it just came straight out of the Pulitzers, you're going to want to keep all of that metadata when someone saves it because you're not going to want to lose that attribution. Um, so like, just to, in support of, uh, the of the single URL allowing you to have multiple options because then you get to serve all three, yep. if not more, constituencies. Can we get Lucas? Do you have a mic for him? So in the meantime, um, actually single URL for the ca use case of metadata is not that helpful because we don't have any way to tell browser when you want the version with metadata or without. Maybe that's something f actually for the picture element where you could specify different resolutions, some for the web and some special version that's original uh, or lossless or metadata rich one. But you could tackle that with the same mechanisms, right? Because basically what, what you're asking for is you have an asset, you want to right click and do, or just save as, and in your accept header you could advertise like, I want the, the full fidelity thing, whatever that means, right? Perhaps your proxy resized it to my uh, viewport. I want the full thing, like I want the high resolution image. Yeah. Okay. Let me take uh, the two, like Lucas and Mark, and then we'll move on to the next topic. So content negotiation is not a new thing. And the ability to have a single URL has been around for probably 10 years, I imagine. Um, and um, in my experience, it's, it's, tough, it's, a, it's tough sledding to sell that to a development team. Um, so I think there's a lot of elegance to, to content negotiation or the idea of having a single URL that you know, presents itself differently. But I think that that's a dedicated project that probably needs to be taken on. I imagine uh, Mark Nottingham, for example, and other people uh, or, um, you know, have gotten close to the problems there, but it, it's, a, it's a separate issue. I think that the web developer community has, has spoken clearly against it. I don't quite understand why, because I appreciate <laughs> the elegance of it, but I, I think the voice of the developer community is pretty clear. So I'm not convinced by that argument because we have gzip and you don't upload a .html.gz 
right? Or CSS.gz, like that's content negotiation. There is a GZ version and some other version. It's the same thing as saying here's a PNG, which is high fidelity, versus a compressed JPEG. So uh, it works. We use it every day. I think there are problems in our stacks in terms of the caches and all the rest uh, where we don't have enough granularity to be able to precisely target particular assets. So we end up doing things like, oh, very unaccept, but the accept header happens to be this very highly fragmented or yeah, high entropy string, which basically fragments the cache. Yeah. So we got to fix those things. That's what Yo was uh, referencing by, uh, by the key spec, which is something that Mark is working on. Okay. And let, me, let me take Mark yeah. one last note, and then we're really way over time on this one. So, uh, oh, geez. Uh, yeah, I think 10 years ago, 15 years ago, the community was fairly anti, but I think I agree with Ilya. Like, the tools are getting there. There's a lot more intermediaries doing things with ConEgg. It's, it's getting easier. My question was about key. It sounds like you guys are depending on it, um, more or less. It's not done. Um, and there are actually some hard problems inside of it. Yep. But we've also not seen a lot of browser interest in it yet. Uh, I need browser engagement by those guys, and we need somebody to actually implement. Unless Yov pulls his trick again and raises 15 grand, uh, <laughs> somebody needs to go and write the code. Okay. So. I think uh, fair point. I'm, I'm actually going to pause here because we're okay. like almost two questions in there. Uh, let, let's talk about the next one. So, so when we when we look at these Im different image formats, um, you know, the, it, it seems like every uh, entity has their own different image formats. So, came the question from from Patty. Uh, why don't we have a test benchmark for image performance? Uh, and if we have that, what should it include? Um, no good reason. Anymore. We should have a um, definitely. We should have a benchmark for for image performance. Um, I think that we should have a, a, a benchmark for for image compression as well. Um, we don't even have a. Well, I guess we do, right? The um, Lena, but it's from. There's this image that um, that people use from um, from 1973. So I think that we could update this, and um, you know, we need to understand like what uh, what these lossy image formats do to our image. So. I think that we should have, um, you know, a set of images that we use that are, are good examples of, of how um, how images get degraded when they get encoded. So um, we should do that, and then also for image performance, definitely um, we should think about that when we're when we're considering these things. We should uh, we should figure out exactly what we need. Let's take uh, actually Jonas's opinion and then go back to the panel. Yeah, I, I was actually when we were on the first topic, I was gonna suggest exactly this. The, one of the big reasons Mozilla has not gotten behind WebP is that there's plainly disagreements about how much better it is compared to JPEG. And I have no, like, I have no idea which, who, who's right about this, but I think having a, a benchmark that people can agree is sort of representative of today's web would provide a lot more information than what we have to go on right now because people just disagree on how, much, how many percent better is this versus that. And this is not just WebP versus JPEG. It's it's between all of these formats. And what would you what would you include? So in that debate back then, you know, one of the, for instance, questions was around whether you should use the existing images on the web as the source for whatever it is you re-encode to versus the um, uh, a pristine image that might be might have been your original. Um, maybe there are other debates. What would you include in that type of image? In that I, type of I that think benchmark? Compare like I think what you want to do. I mean, the thing that actually matters is. How fast can you download an, th the image that is being displayed in a browser? Like, I don't care how much, what, how you can compress the like the 10 megabyte original image and how much smaller you can make that. What actually matters is the the, the smaller images that we download and render on web pages. Uh, how how many bytes can we, how many bytes smaller can we make them? One one of the really hard things is there are like four different ways of measuring image quality, uh, and and. I have no idea what the difference, different algorithms are, but like getting, I don't know if we need to measure all of them in the in this benchmark, or if we just need to, as a community, agree on one or two that are sort of more representative for what the human eye actually appreciates. Um, but but I think that having a discussion around um, around what is what actually um, what we should actually measure. Because uh, a bad benchmark, this is something we see a lot in JavaScript, the bad benchmark can do just as much harm as, as, a, um, yep, that's a, good as a good benchmark but can Karel, do. Karel, you, you deal with this. You, uh, you yes, benchmark your own tools a, all the time. That's <laughs> a big problem uh, for my work on uh, PNG compressors. 
uh, there is, although there are standard test suites for uh, photo-like images, there is popular uh, Kodak image suite, uh, there is no uh, test suite that includes uh, alpha channel for images. So for testing how well alpha channel compresses, I have to steal images from the web. Uh, but this is not a set of images that I could share with anybody to uh, let them compare their results with mine. Uh, there's also a big problem of uh, judging actual quality. So we have uh, machine algorithms that sort of emulate uh, how uh, I see uh, distortions in images, but this is very imperfect. But it's also very sensitive. The algorithm can detect uh, half a percent change in image quality, which is needed when you develop uh, your codec to, when you tweak something and make it half percent better, you want to keep that change. But if you ask a human, is that half percent better than the other image? They will not be able to tell you. Um, yeah, which is similar to the, which algorithm do we use for quality? What's the bar? What's the threshold? Yes, and, uh, since, and since there are different implementations of different approximations of how people judge uh, quality, there are different opinions. And what, if you use one algorithm, then uh, somebody pro developing a different uh, codec will tell you, no, you've used the wrong algorithm. You should be benchmarking using my algorithm on my images. So I think this is also one of the areas reasons why we have so much disagreement between all the different formats is because everybody uses their own test set. So when we say images, do we mean photos, high-res photos? Do we mean uh, the PNGs and the alpha channel? And we all mean the animated GIFs. Everybody and animated, animated GIFs, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, so one of the things that kind of the WebP team has been pushing uh, for all the time is like, we, we always say we're optimized for the web in the sense that we try to uh, grab images off the web as they are being used today, not just some like a bunch of really high def raw formats off my camera. That's a use case. That's a valid, totally valid use case. That is not representative of the entire web, yeah. right? And we try to optimize for those. In fact, we see uh, a lot better compression and gains on kind of the t the long tail of weird images, right? The stuff we put on PNGs is bizarre. Yeah. And the, gets, the problem yeah. for me is I don't run Google Images, so I don't have access to that set. Well, we don't actually have a good access to that set either, right? Like one idea would be to say, great, let's go to HP Archive, download all the images, and just recompress all of them with our algorithms. But then you discover that you're recompressing artifacts of other formats. So really, we, ideally, we would have like the, the origin yeah. or the original asset, right? And then we would have a test against all the different formats, but that's very hard to come by. Well, so yeah, that's, that's one of the criticisms I have heard regarding WebP, that the fact that current uh, numbers are achieved by recompressing introduce their own bias and their own artifacts. Right. And, and so... So, and this is yeah. funny because, like, we actually had this really long discussion, the WebP team with, like, the Google Plus team. They, they really care about photos, right? They want to deliver really beautiful photos. And at one point, we found that we were talking to the product managers effectively trying to replicate JPEG compression artifacts, <laughs> right? Like yeah. the formats are different. You're going to get different artifacts, but they really like the JPEG artifacts. Yeah, which once again comes right Good. because it's like that's what we're used to seeing. Yeah. We're like, look, this is so the similarity. Do you need to be similar to the original <laughs> right. or similar to the encoded? Let's take uh, Wellesley's point. Can you hear me? Yeah. There we go. Um, going back to the comment that was made earlier about the file size. Does that really matter when um, the decoder may take longer? Uh, say, for the instance, of WebP versus JPEG. WebP is going to take longer to decode that image based on the CPU and what system resources that uh, computer has. So, how do you base? How do you get a benchmark for that kind of performance? And and are you guys concerned about that? Yeah, it's uh, so definitely yeah. a big concern. So, you know, speaking about WebP, it's, something, it's definitely an area that we're looking to improve. So we're landing new kind of incremental uh, decoding uh, improvements and all the rest. There is hardware support that will come down the road. It's kind of a chicken and the egg problem. Yeah. Um, and despite that, we do see that you know, when we run uh, test studies, eBay actually did a study where they converted all their images to WebP and they compared uh, kind of decoding time versus the delivery time. Because the images were shipped much faster, even though you're decoding it longer, they still showed up faster. So you can quantify these things. You can use something like uh, see how much of the image is rendered at each point in time, and it is quantifiable. Let's get David's point and move to the next topic. David? Yeah. yeah. Um, I guess 
the, the one other thing to think about is that the, this, th there's this file size versus quality trade-off. And what, the, what, a, what these new formats are doing is sort of s very slightly shifting that curve in the file size versus quality trade-off. But the, I, I guess the other question that developers, I think, should think about is, are they at the right point on that curve? Are people making the file size versus quality trade-off that they want to be making? Yes. Okay. The, the, this is a big topic, an underexplored topic. So um, we're pushing new formats that are getting 10, 15, 20, 30% improvement in file size. But there's the other side of this equation, which is all of those formats have the quality slider, which the developers and designers are just not using. Because yep, we, we don't have the right tooling to expose that sort of thing. And it's like a quality 40 or 50 on a WebP is completely different from a quality 50 on JPEG. In fact, it's a different output, even if you use different JPEG compressors. Right? Yes. Like each one introduces its own artifacts. So I think we could do way, way better job by providing some better tooling and visualization to like when you're saving these images or automation. Like yeah. how do you find the right point on that curve where the trade-off between the, how much the image is degraded yeah. versus right. savings? The thing is there are, I'm not sure we have the ideal tools, but we have uh, tools like uh, Imagemin that uh, Cornell worked on to add asset. It was based on some uh, previous metric. He added SIM, which is more standard image visual metric, in order to just binary search the the ideal quantity. So a developer can define, I want a five percent quality loss, yeah. or something much more quantifiable I mean, than the a, quality yeah. Sorry setting, the, uh, which is. We're kind of going over, but I think that yeah, actually sure. feeds up. We can probably discuss this a little bit more in the next question, which is, uh, what should be our strategy for managing these multi-resolution images? So a, a part of it is about maybe just the image, the straight tooling. But you know, as as dealing with that image becomes more complex, as you know, we mentioned before already, a certain bias in favor of automation. If we're going to use a single URL, um, you know, what should be what should be the strategy? Should people try and pre-generate these ahead of time? a lot of these tools around the uh, binary search, for instance, are very hard to do real time or are not practical at all sometimes yeah. to do in real time. You know, yeah. what, what's the right, maybe, Cornell, what do you think on that? Um, so generating multiple resolution images by hand is super boring. So we definitely, definitely should have tools that automate this. Um, and when we have a tool that automatically generates different uh, sizes, we can no longer ask the author to tweak this quality slider themselves. So I want to get completely eliminate the quality slider from all UIs for images. It's a complete lie. It's not actual quality you're getting. It's just arbitrary mathematical formula for throwing away bits of data from the file. And it makes some files ugly. Some files can tolerate more uh, compression. And we should use um, CPU power that we have, algorithms that we have to try to get the right quality. And even if the algorithm is not perfect, it's probably be still going to be better than many authors who have their favorite uh, number they always use for all the images. Yeah. And, and, and uh, what would you want to do? If, what's your optimal? You need to support these you know, 17 different variants <laughs> of images and optimize them in your site. I mean, automatic. I'm not going <laughs> to do that by Automatic hand. real time or automatic build time? Um, like automatic in, in while oh, delivery? Yeah, or? probably. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. I think probably in delivery. Uh, although it'd be nice to check them, right? Uh, I think that's amazing what Cornell is saying that um, that we should get rid of the sliders. I mean, he's saying that. He's saying we should get rid of the, like the quality <laughs> sliders in our um, in our images that we're optimizing. Wow. Uh, I think that's right, right? I think that we as humans, uh, you know, the, the numbers, our magic numbers that we come up with don't work for all of, the, all of the photos. And that maybe we can like automatically figure out what's the best, exactly the best quality to set a certain photo at. That's cool. And I think, uh, Katja, before you are, but oh. the, is the... Yeah. I think that the question of offline versus online so offline is always will always get you better ratios, but you can't always do that. So offline when you can, and otherwise, uh, for I mean, anything even if you compress on the fly, you should probably cache it, and you should probably try to recompress the original after the fact. Uh, but we're talking about fairly complex backends, but. 
Um, yeah, as we said, the image min stuff, the binary search recompress the image multiple times, that's CPU consuming. That's not something you can do mm -hmm. on the fly. Let's take a push for uh, uh, Mark. Um, so I just want to provide a little color for that. Um, we do generate at Photo Shelter. We, uh, we deal with a lot of um, image delivery from very high resolution files, TIFF, un, uh, you know, uh, non-lossy um, non files, RAWs, et cetera. Um, and we have to generate you know, web-friendly versions. So we do do the image variance multi-res on the fly. Um, but I just kind of want to tie it together with the previous kind of compression discussion uh, and how difficult it is it to b benchmark and even with you know, uh, algorithmic ways to analyze quality, it, you know, it, it doesn't really capture the subjective um, sort of how the perceptual aspect of it. And we had a, we basically change our image pipeline not too often every few years, but you know, we, when we do, it takes like a whole year to decide what trade-offs are worthwhile. Um, and we did find that this question about you know, JPEG quality, we're still we're using JPEG, we're not using any, because it's the only thing that works universally. Uh, but that it's, it gets complicated because with the multi-resolution and also the compression and the rescaling, um, they are all interactive. So we have found that actually that you have to, you can, doing that file size and quality trade-off depends on the, also the, the size that you're delivering the image that actually on a larger resolution image you can get away with more compression and kind of counterbalance. Um, so I think that is very important obviously. I'm not saying that any of these image formats are trying to be prescriptive, but you can only get so far trying to optimize the algorithm and the format because yep. you need to leave a certain amount of control um, to the developer and the delivery mechanism. Uh, because we did find that we had to fine tune significantly. Um, and now with high DPI displays, now you can get away with even more compression to deliver even a larger asset that's not perceptually uh, relevant. So this is kind of okay. a little feedback. No, thanks. That's good input. Let me, uh, so we only have a few more minutes. Uh, let me actually skip a couple of questions and switch to the, uh, the sort of uh, crystal ball question at the end, uh, which is, you know, we, we've gone, w one of the reasons for the growth of images has been, um, uh, you know, retina displays, and, you know, now we have a batch of new 3X or kind of 3X uh, uh, screens, which Android has been doing in, in iOS, and which Android has been doing for a while. W what, uh, what would you... Uh, guess, I guess, what's your prediction for the future? Is this, uh, are we done at uh, the 2.3x? Is there ever a done uh, component of their virtual reality and 3D <laughs> images? But you had an opinion about this before. Right? Uh, yeah, my opinion was I don't care because we're not doing like what we can right now with 2x. <laughs> so um, I think it, uh, I think that we, you know, at a certain point we can't really tell the difference. Like there's not going to be such a jump from 2x to 3x. It's not really going to be 3x, right? I don't think that, uh, I think that, you know, I don't know, I'm, I'm kind of like, I'm on the side of like delivering worse images faster than <laughs> <laughs> delivering perfect images. So, so um, it's less about the density, but more about we, we need to educate our users to <laughs> try to get progressive image first, get something. Definitely, no definitely. Let's focus on that first. Um, but I think it's exciting. I love to see a high retina image like <laughs> on, on the web. I think it's really beautiful. So, um, but I don't think how much, I don't, I'm not sure how much more we can push it. And Colonel, I think you have some opinions on this. Uh. Um, well, we're upgrading our displays, but we're not upgrading our eyes yet. And the eyes are the ultimate benchmark. So, so we should I think work on upgrading our eyes. That's the end. Yes, <laughs> we should go for cyborgs. But uh, before then, I think we'll settle on something like 2x or 3x, because it just doesn't make any sense to put more pixels. What do you think, Ilya? That If I remember the marketing correctly, Retina was, was defined as you can't see the difference anymore. So when they come out with Retina HD, I'm just like, <laughs> <laughs> can't see the difference. So, but, but practically speaking, um, that's fine for us, uh, you know, maybe performance nerds here uh, uh, saying that, but, you know, the reality is that they, sh they did ship 3X and, you know, would they ship a 4X and would our designers insist that they want to use those? I think we need data on how much of a difference does it make if we send out 2x images to 3x, 4x, whatever x displays, and have hard data so that if the de designers come with 4x images, we can throw <laughs> them out the door. And uh, there was a, at Velocity last week, uh, this week, uh, uh, research regarding uh, progressive JPEGs that was done basically by looking at how people react to images displayed on the screen. And regardless of the result, which is uh, somewhat surprising, 
I think we need to do the same for contentiously bad images. For images, if we, what happens if we display 1x images on a 3x display? How bad is it as far as user experience goes? Same for 2x images, etc. We need data. We need to switch to the data. Yeah, and the results there were not favorable of progressive images, yeah. uh, despite everybody's hypothesis in the room ahead of time. Um, so I think, um, OK, we still have five more minutes. So I misestimated the times here. Um, so I guess maybe we, we switch to uh, Andrew's question from here, um, which is, we, we, you know, we talk, those are all technical questions. But if we talk a little bit about a use case question, move one back. Um, how important is it that an image format we use on a website uh, is, is one that a user can save and view in a different spot? I mean, we, talked, we touched this a little bit because we talked about the multi-URL so they can open it everywhere. But does it matter that the OS gets into display, or are we done at browsers? Um, so I think it, it really depends on use case. So yeah. Ideally, it should be viewable. right? So if I save it, I should be able to view it with whatever software that I have. Uh, by default, that would be nice. Uh, we do have some examples where that doesn't appear to be a problem. So for example, Opera and Chrome have been, we have the compression proxies, which have been transcoding all images to WebP for years. And users are happy. And as far as I'm aware, I have not heard anybody scream about saving out images as WebPs, which is what you would get. Because we don't have like a, a, a safe save or something else. So that's an example. There are plenty of big sites that also use WebP. Uh, eBay, uh, OkCupid, okay, all those sites, right? It doesn't appear to be a problem. Is that a good, good answer? I'm not convinced that it is, but. But you don't think it's a blocker? You think, no. You think our primary conversation should remain in browser land, right. uh, if, and if the OS case, would, would catch up? Right. If your use case actually involves downloading an image, right? You have a photo gallery, and an yeah. actual save as is not a right click. I'm not even sure how many like, non technical users know to right click and save as. Right, they're probably fishing for the download button somewhere in the UI. Yeah. That button should do something smart, like not save the fancy new format. It should save the safe format. Can browsers do a better job? Probably. And then do you think like, when you're, you deal with a social sharing platform? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's very important um, to be able to like, not break <laughs> the image. <laughs> um, but yeah, and I think Elio's getting on something really kind of interesting. It depends on what kind of site you have. If you have like a, if you have your own like photo gallery, I think it's important for you, for you to be able to, to save as, right click, drag to your desktop. Um, there's kind of a cool hack, I think only with Chrome, where you can actually, when you drag to your desktop, you can deliver a different high res image. That's kind of cool. Um, but yeah, definitely, I, I, don't, I don't like the idea. I love right clicking. I love like taking images off offline. Oh, yeah. so, so, it's important, sharing them. so it's important to be able to do the save as, as we talked about before. Mm -hmm. But then you'd, you'd need to convert to something that's a little bit more universal. Yeah. yeah. People Let's, do share images. They, sh uh, they remix images. Uh, you know, all your uh, lolcat images, they were saved from somewhere. Um, so WebP can work as a sort of a DRM for photos, where you save it to desktop, and then you try to open it. Oh, you don't have the right plugin. Um. <laughs> can we get uh, Margaret? I'm like, uh, hi. Um, I work on Firefox for Android, and we actually um, have a UI telemetry to see what people use in the browser. And actually, the save image. Uh, context menu in Firefox, at least, is like one of the highest menu items that people use. And we kind of wonder what kind of images they're saving necessarily. But that's like, a, <laughs> I just want to throw out that data that we do have data that people use that a lot. So you probably wouldn't want to break that. Excellent. So, yeah. so safe share, safe saving should probably be a thing. Yeah. Either for uh, yeah, either for client side markup picture based uh, multiple images or for server side, because we can play with the accept headers. Right. Cool. Okay. I think that this panel actually has like a action item. I think they're a good item. So we talked about. I think we agreed that we want uh, a single URL, not multiple images. Mm -hmm. That we need to create a test benchmark. Although we haven't talked about how we we actually <laughs> go about doing that to one that everybody agrees upon. Uh, so maybe <laughs> if you have really good images that you cannot compress well, uh, send them to yeah, Edgecom. Email them to Cornell or put or them in a Dropbox yeah, yeah. or something because the email yeah. is going to be too big. Uh, I compress them before. Uh, no, no, don't. Actually, no. No, no, like last uh, <laughs> PNG is good. Um, I think we should seriously try to get um, a yeah. set of images that are going to be our test benchmark and 
you know, do this. Cornell, <laughs> or, or yeah. one of us should take responsibility for this. So, so, so on that note, and we'll use the last minute that we have here to talk about building that benchmark. Should, who, who do you think should that type of effort come from? Should that be a, a Mozilla, Chrome, uh, like one of the browser vendors that's pushing the image formats uh, doing it? Should it be a standards activity? It's a moving target. Ideally, I'd like to have some sort of a process, sort of like HTTP archive, where we just say, here's the latest set of images. And perhaps our job is to define some sort of filters on all of those images to say, like, this, these are the safe ones to use. Because I also don't want to freeze that set, because the web evolves, right? Yeah. All of a sudden, we're, we are serving 2x and 3x images. And perhaps there, there are different algorithms that do better at high resolution images. So. Yeah, it's interesting. It's, it's like, process. what is the average kind of content also that is being served on the internet? Right. Like, that's how do we even get that? Right. But that's important because. It turns out the most popular image on the web is a one by one pixel. <laughs> <laughs> right? It's like, yeah. let's compress that. I think we're yeah, <laughs> done. Good. good. Well, so I think we're done. Thank you very much. Yeah.